We had started a series last week on strongholds out of 2 Corinthians, and we kind of was defining our terms of strongholds, looking at some verses, and we want to continue to develop that this evening. And so we're going to be here in our text, and like I said, this is a series that I had taught in school a couple years back, 2018, I believe. And so we had fun with it. I actually didn't get all the way through it in school, and the kids didn't complain at all. It was kind of like, whoo, thank God that's over. And uh, I was looking forward to trying to finishing that series up. It's a wonderful series. And it's, a lot of this material is not original. Some of it is. A lot of it tonight we'll be looking at is original. But there is a gentleman that I dearly love. I have met him a couple of times in my life, Dr. R.B. Ulett. And it's a French last word. It has a lot of letters in it, uh, you let. And uh, he is a gentleman that has written quite a few books and I have a few of his books. And he has one called Pulling Down of Strongholds is what his is called. And so it's kind of formatted from some of that material taken. It's very good material if you want a book to read that it deals with this. Uh, he was an excellent writer. And another book that I highly recommend that he has is A More Sure Word by Dr. R.B. Ouellette and probably one of the best, uh, I wouldn't even, it's not really a commentary, but it falls in the category of a commentary on the Word of God. And uh, for some of my writing, my thesis for a master's degree, I wrote on the, the Word of God, the AV 1611, and had done some research and another gentleman that I follow had made a statement in a study or a class that I was in, Dr. Mark Monte, and he had said that you really don't know much about a subject until you've written 25 to 30 books on that subject. I thought, wow, that is a lot of book. That's a lot of work. And so I took that to heart when I began to work on that uh, thesis, and I... <laughs> had read, I think I got to about 17 or 18. It was so much work and so much information to compile. It took me a couple years to actually digest what I had studied originally. And it ended up being well. I still have that work. And I had studied and taught that work probably four years ago here in this church. And it goes over. And every once in a while, we pull it out and go over it. And so these are men that I like and admire and enjoy listening to and, and not necessarily following, but I do listen to their, their studies and their preaching. And so I wanted to add that. The book, it doesn't, not, it, I'm sure it's copywritten, but it, a lot of them will say you're not allowed to take ex excerpt from it or copy it, and I, rightfully so, but this book is not. It's wide open, and in sort of the Lord had published it for Dr. R.B. Ouellette. And so that is a good book. I want to recommend that. But this is kind of the, what it's following. And he has a whole lot more in the book I'm just not going to get into. I want to format it into more of a, a light study, and then we'll move through it. And it's not a big book, but I do want to mention that here. If you found your place, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, we'll begin reading in verse number 3. It says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations in every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, again, we bow before you and we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. And Father, how we can dwell on just a few portions of your scripture and, and gain knowledge and understanding for us today. Father, things that we can learn. Now, Father, be with those that have come out, suit a, a blessing to their hearts and their lives and the families that are representative here, the businesses and everything that goes on. Father, I pray that you continue to bless your people as you've promised. And Father, be with our church. But be with the services tonight. Be with those watching on stream, live stream. And uh, Father, we want to pray for them tonight on our prayer petition. Fill me with your Holy Spirit tonight. Give me utterance to speak and make clarity of your word. We ask all this in Jesus Christ's blessed name. We pray. Amen. So again, here I won't try to rehash everything that we went over last week, but we did start and define strongholds, and we wanted to capture the, the, the meaning or the setting uh, of what the Apostle Paul is dealing with here, and one of those was the mind, the imagination. Not necessarily physical, not, not a physical aspect, although physical, uh, the physical side has somewhat to do with it, but the spiritual, the mental, 
is the biggest booger bear, if you please, that gives you and I as Christians trouble, and it can run away with you. And we dealt with some of illustrations dealing with, you know, you, you get around a good friend and they begin to share with you maybe a, a detail about their life and, and maybe something that might be, not be very pleasant, but uh, you might be in a counseling session and you hear one side of a story and your mind and imagination runs off with what you were told from one side. And then you later find out that there was another side to that story. And it kind of balances itself out in your mind. And so we begin to look and ponder and develop the thought that your mind, our minds, uh, can easily run away with us. And this is what was going on in the doctrinal setting here. The Apostle Paul is laying out some things. And he's getting ready to defend himself because this church here at Corinth was saying and imagining things about uh, their, their uh, spiritual father or the Apostle Paul here that was trying to instruct them in the knowledge of God. But you notice here in verse 4, it says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. So we want to say that, first of all, we need to say that protection strongholds keeps out danger. We'll have protection strongholds. The Word of God is a protection stronghold. Uh, your salvation uh, the basic fundamental doctrines of eternal security, and you move through the basic doctrine, the doctrine of redemption, the doctrine of imputation. Uh, you have these fundamental doctrines that are very clear in Scripture that you uh, are able to hold and to keep you, you and I, protected from the danger. Protection strongholds keeps out danger. And so we uh, had kind of introduced a prison stronghold kind of the negative side to this, this mental battle that you have and that Paul is laying out. He says, look, uh, you have imaginations. You need to be able to cast down these imaginations that exalt themselves above the knowledge of God. And the knowledge of God is what God has laid out, uh, the Word of God here, the clarity of the Word of God and the teaching of the Word of God. And oft times through the day, we'll have these imaginations that will plague you in your, in your life. And we're going to look at a man tonight, and hopefully, Lord willing, we'll see as, as what pastor wants to leave, maybe the following Wednesday we'll see, or the following one. The next one we'll look at another man. So we're going to get some, some scripture uh, to develop our thoughts here. But that's what I want to say. Let me say this with my notes, and then we'll get over to our next part of our scripture, and we're watching the time. If he can, the devil stating, uh, the devil will uh, convince you that God does not love you. In your mind, in your heart, uh, he will put that inside of you. And you begin to think along those lines, and that will develop itself naturally just the way we are as human nature. Uh, the devil will convince you and I that the difficult and painful things that happen uh, to you and I are evidence that God doesn't love you. I've had those thoughts enter my mind and uh, begin to plague me, and I know that was not of God. It was not of God. And tonight, if you've had those minds or those thinkings or those thoughts, or if you please, those imaginations, that is not from God. That is from your adversary, the devil. Now, last time when we developed this, we were in Acts, Acts chapter 5, and we looked at Ananias and Sapphira, uh, uh, Ananias, or Ananias, his wife, Sapphira, and they had, they, had a, they had some trouble there, and it cost them their life. But it said this in a phrase. It says, in, uh, Peter was stating, he says, why has uh, Satan has put this in thine heart to lie or to sin against God or the Holy Ghost? And you say, well, what does that say? And we, we, we said this, that Satan has the ability to put stuff into your mind, in your imagination. And he will play with it like a yo-yo. And it depends on where you're at spiritually. Even a strong person can, can fall prey to this in seconds by maybe what they're told over the phone, maybe a letter they hear, maybe something they watch on news. Nowadays, that happens just about every day if you're watching the news. But you'll get, you'll get information or you'll get news delivered to you, and some of it's not good, and your mind runs off with it. Well, when Satan sees that happen, and he sees the fear come into you, and he sees the fear take over your decision-making in your life, and your mind, and he sees the effects of it, he doesn't know personally what you're thinking, but he can, he's a pretty good mathematician on how this is going to go. He begins to put more in there. and So he'll work with your mind and your imagination, just like these people here in Corinth. So we're going to look at some scriptures 
It says, in Scripture's teaching, let me read this to you. Psalms 34, 19 says, Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. Uh, God does not promise to keep you out of trouble. See, some of that gets uh, a little miscrewed when you deal with a new Christian or a convert, or maybe even a lost person, look at, Christian, at Christianity, and they think, well, you know, I, I want everything to be just right. And there's, there's the wealth and health preachers out there that says, well, if you're not driving a BMW or a Mercedes and living in a big house and have a nice home, everything's just right, then you're not in the will of God, or God isn't blessing you. Well, here, this, the Bible speaks contrary to that type of teaching or preaching. It says here that many are the afflictions of the righteous, but God the Lord delivereth him out of them all. God does not promise to keep you and I out of trouble. He promises to take you through trouble. And a lot of times we get weary going through that trouble. We give up on God. God never gives up on us because uh, he's immutable. And when God promises something, he keeps his promises he keeps his promises. So let me say this, if you're taking notes, prison strongholds protect from truth. So we had introduced prison strongholds at the, at the beginning of this. And we said prison strongholds might be a belief or a thought, something that you've held to that imprison you. And prison strongholds protect you from truth. And by, let me, If it's confusing, let me say it this way. Prison strongholds are not good. Protection strongholds are what you need. They keep you from danger. But prison strongholds protect you from truth. And so uh, let's, we'll develop this side tonight, I think. Uh, let me read some notes. And I'm going to take you to 1 Samuel chapter 15. We're going to look at a man tonight. If you want to turn there, I'm going to read some more notes. And then we'll go to 1 Samuel chapter 15. We're going to look at this gentleman. He was a king of Israel, the first king of Israel. And uh, we're going to look at uh, how... Um, how his mind worked and through what the Lord leaves us in his Bible. Here, let me say this. You are going to live somewhere forever in your life. You and I, we have eternity we're looking at. Uh, the devil wants to build a stronghold to make you think in eternity that heaven and hell isn't necessarily real or it doesn't exist. And I think... I want to say, you know, the polling's big because we're coming up on an election year. So I think the polling or the census on that, somewhere around about 85 to 90 percent of people in the world believe that heaven and hell doesn't really exist. It's like an imagination or euphoria. It's not really real or literal. And uh, that's dangerous ground. Satan has done his work very well. But uh, the devil wants to build a stronghold to make you think heaven and hell doesn't exist. And there is no eternity for which to prepare. You see, when you begin to deal with a lost person, a person that has not accepted Christ, uh, they're, in their mind they might think of, of dying, they think of death, and they think of more of the pain and the, the trouble that comes with it, but rarely do they ever actually think of eternity because of what's taught and what's really accepted out there today. There's really, you know, when you die, you're dead like, like a dog. Or uh, when you die, they're, they're, the soul, is, it, it's, there's nothing left to you. It's over. It's done. You live life once. Well, that's not the teaching of the Bible or Scripture, and uh, that is not so. But Satan would want you to believe that, even Christians. Uh, Christians today <laughs> live like, a lot of Christians today live like there is no eternity. It doesn't really matter. And it's sad, a sad state that you find that, Find that uh, a Christian, the average Christian today, in the pew. If the devil succeeds, people will ignore the conviction of the Holy Spirit and reject the gospel message. You see, uh, Satan, the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those that which would believe. So naturally, a lost person's eyes and his mind, his spiritual eyes, if you please, are blinded. And this is kind of where we're dealing with. Turn with me to 1 Samuel. We'll begin to look at our first person tonight. 1 Samuel chapter 15, I want to notice in this chapter, and I think I'll have you, uh, I think uh, we're going to go to 1 Samuel chapter 22 here in a minute, I want to show some context, uh, and the setting is you have the, the man of God, Samuel, is given the word of the Lord, and God tells Samuel to go to the king of Israel, which is Saul, and he tells him, he gives him instructions on what to do. So we're going to see that. 
First Samuel chapter 15, Samuel also said unto Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore, hearken thou unto the voice of the, the words of the Lord. So he's getting this from the man of God. And look at verse 3. He says, Now go and smite uh, uh, Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not, but slay both man and women, infant and suckling and ox and sheep and camel and ass. And Saul gathered the people together and numbered them and and Talaman and 200,000 footmen and 10,000 men of Judah. Now, for the sake of time, let's drop back down to verse 13 in in that chapter. And it says, And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou of the Lord. And this is after this thing has taken place, after uh, Saul has supposedly killed everything he was supposed to kill and, and uh, do what God had told him to do here in this setting. But we'll see here, now let's read on. He said, Blessed be thou of the Lord. I'm in verse 13. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Notice this, this mindset of the king Saul. Now, if you study Saul individually and look at his character, he had a lot of different things going on in his mind, and a lot of them were contrary to the Word of God. This is one of them here, one of the most startling ones that you'll see of Saul. He says, I perform the commandment of the Lord. And now watch this. And Samuel said, what meaneth then this bleeding of the sheep? I like, I like how the man of God, Samuel, questions him. If you've done everything that God has told you to do, then what am I hearing? Is my hearing dull? Am I hearing things? And he was. And he says, what's this, the bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of oxen which I hear? And Saul said, they, now watch the third person plural, all right? Uh, He said, uh, and Saul said, they have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. And we see here as this develops, uh, then Samuel said unto Saul, Stay, and I will tell thee what the Lord hath said to me this night. So God spoke to Samuel a second time, and he was discouraged with it. If you read the whole chapter, we're going to highlight this for the sake of our point tonight, talking about the imagination and how men's minds uh, can deceive them very easily. And here we're seeing a man, he, he heard what, what Samuel had told him about killing everything. It's very specific, very clear on that. Well, we find out that that's not what he did, but he thinks he has done everything that God has told him to do. And right right in here, I want to ask you a question to you, you and I tonight. You know, God has a lot of specific things laid out in his word. And so you're going to run in your mind one or two places in your mind. You're either going to run to a prison stronghold and it's going to go, go contrary to the truth of the word of God, or you're going to go to a protection stronghold which is the truth of the Word of God. Here we're looking at a man that did not go to a truth stronghold in his mind. His imagination got caught up, and he's thinking that he's doing right, but he has not done right. Now watch this. He knows this, but he's acting like he, everything's okay. Drop back to verse 20, and we'll see what happens here. And Saul said, same chapter, uh, verse 20, And Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, Uh, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. Now, this is Saul saying this again, the second time. Uh, And I have gone the way which the Lord sent me. Watch all this. And have brought Agag, the king of Amalekite, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. He, He is lying to himself. He's already been questioned on, what is this I hear then? I'm not supposed to hear any sheep, Saul. I'm not supposed to hear any oxen lowing. And I'm not supposed to be seeing the Amalekite king alive. And he's there. So we see that he has not followed the, the, the word of the Lord. In verse 21, but the people took. Now watch how he's, he's went from they to the people. Now he's identified the group of people who he's going to lay this blame on. But the people took of the spoil, the sheep and the oxen, and the sheep uh, of the things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice unto the Lord. So he knows he should have, everything should have been destroyed, but he did not do that. He, he has disobeyed the word of the Lord. And we can look at that, we can see that, but then when we turn the coin and put ourselves in the same position of Saul and begin to look at the things that God has put his finger on in your heart and in your life, and you have turned a blind ear to it, you have turned a cold heart to the word of the Lord, we're right in the same mix with the disobedience of King Saul. 
and we have run to a prison stronghold. Those that are struggling with family issues, you think you're dealing with, with true strongholds? Those battling and dealing with, with personal issues in your life and you can't seem to get the victory over it, you think you've run to a true stronghold? I know I've confessed I haven't. There's things in our lives that we don't realize that you and only you know and I and only I know in my heart and in my mind that isn't quite right with God. And this is right where we're at. And we're looking at how the mind can deceive a person in the actions speak of what's in the mind and heart we're watching this watch this and so he says but the people took up the spoil and the sheep and the oxen and the chief things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice unto the lord thy god in gilgal now watch verse 22 and samuel said hath the lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the lord that question is you do you think god likes sacrifice Better than obedience? And Saul somehow in his mind had thought that God would delight in sacrificing than actually obeying what he told him to do. In our lives, how many sacrifices have you and I made for the sake of Christ or God? Ah, I'll throw in an extra hundred. I'll come to a little bit more church. Uh, I'll even attend the 4th of July parade, pass out some tracts. But what has God actually told us really to do? To be faithful, to be obedient, to do certain things in our life, whatever they may be. The Holy Spirit knows what they are. I might hit some of the highlights. I might even hit one of them by mistake or mishap. I know what's in my heart. I know the things I battle in, and Satan battles with me and the things that need to line up with the Word of God. Simple things that God puts in my mind and in my heart. The Holy Spirit can prick the heart. And here you're seeing it come out. Now, the obvious answer to the questions, the two-point question is, no, God likes obedience better than sacrifice. Well, uh, I think I can work my way to heaven. That, that's, that's, a, that's like a sacrifice. I'm going to sacrifice my time, my talent, my treasure, and I think God will be more pleased with that than just actually accepting Jesus Christ for who He is and asking Him to be my Savior and for Him to sit on the throne of my life and to obey him in his word. But here we're seeing that Saul, who knows God, he'd heard the word of God, and here he's dealing with this question. So watch as this forms. And he says in verse 23, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Uh, that's where God puts it, and that's where the, the man of God had put rebellion. And stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Wow, he's, already, he's got four or five sins in here already. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. So we see here that a prison stronghold in the King Saul's mind and heart had caused him to believe that sacrificing rather than obeying was a better thing to do. And here we're seeing that this is not necessarily, this is not true. It's contrary to what God wanted him to do. And because of that, God said, that's fine, but I've rent the kingdom out of your hand, and I've given it to another, thy neighbor, which was David. And then you know the onslaught of that, what unfolds, Saul attempts to try to take David's life. And so we see here by looking at King Saul, we got a few moments as we look at this, uh, we see that King Saul had, had prison strongholds in his mind, and it caused him to think wrongly, and it caused him to act wrongly. Seek protection strongholds when tempted. You see, there was a temptation that come in here somewhere. Now, he says, thy people, and he says it was the people that did this. Whether he allowed them to do that, he was the king. If you remember, Saul was pretty weird about uh, doing certain things. I remember one time in a battle, uh, he had run the men and the cavalrymen. He had run them hard all day, and they were, they were faint of hunger. And uh, the, he had told him, look, don't drink any water, don't drink any, any honey, anything. Don't touch the honey. I think they'd run across some honey. And uh, he had kept it from them. And his son, Jonathan, had come, and I think, and eat of the honey, and it lightened him and gave him energy, and he went on with it. And uh, he said if anybody would eat of it, he was going to kill him. He had some crazy things in his mind and in his imagination, and it caused him to fall prey to this type of thinking. Uh, you remember the famous one when he went to the witch of Endor because he was troubled because Samuel had died. The man, the man of God here, he had died. He was old. 
and he needed to hear from whether he should go into battle with his enemy or not, whether to pursue or not, and so he wanted to hear from Samuel. You can read, read about that. Is it had messed up uh, thinking and imagination. You say, why? Because he chose not to obey God. He chose to go his own way. You say, what, what is the result? What, what caused that? It was, he wasn't able to cast down the imagination that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. And he went against, against uh, God's word. And we see here that it cost him. To obey is better than sacrifice when it comes to your mind. And here's what we're saying tonight. Seek protection strongholds when tempted. There's a lot that the Bible has to say about that. What we see as we study strongholds, and we'll see as we develop this, is that there are two kinds the kind we have been talking about is a prison stronghold. Uh, it keeps you from truth. And I, I used the illustration last week about dealing with people on doctrinal issues or about salvation. We used the illustration on salvation. You can talk about a number of things, politics. Uh, you can talk about sports. You can talk about personal. Talk about work. You can talk about uh, all, all sorts of things. But when you begin to deal with religion, and then when you really personalize it and you begin to ask about salvation, people get funny. And their mind, they run to a prison stronghold in their mind. I don't want to hear this. I don't want nothing to do with this. And they shut down. You even see Christians do that. You begin to deal with them maybe on an issue that they're having. You begin to lay out some truth from the Word of God. And you can tell just how it's taken. It's, ooh, ooh. They get turned off. This is what had taken place. You notice that Saul did not want to deal directly with what God had ordered him to do. And so you'll find people in a prison stronghold in their mind will not want truth. It protects them from truth, the prison strongholds. And so we see that these keep us from freedom and far from the truth, prison strongholds. But there's also a stronghold of protection available to us. Take your Bibles and we're going to end with these. Psalms chapter 18. And we're going to develop this. This is kind of still the introduction and we're going to look at five, I think we have five areas where whether you can tell you are dealing with a prison stronghold or a truth stronghold in your life. Some of these here that Saul dealt with in discerning whether he had a stronghold was the second one, and I'm getting ahead in my notes. Uh, you have a stronghold if you are committed to a course of action contrary to Scripture's. That's point number two in knowing whether you have a prison stronghold problem in your mind is you have a stronghold if you're committed to a course of action contrary to Scripture in your life. And that can apply personally. It can apply as a family unit. It can apply collectively as a body, a body of, of, of believers. And so you, you have that, and he's dealing with that. The third one that he had a problem with that we've seen tonight with Saul was you have a strong home if you resist the word of God. You know, Saul, King Saul, King, King of Israel, with a man of God there telling him what God was saying, he resisted the word of God, knowing that. I'm going to show, let me show this to you. We got, we got enough time. In 1 Samuel, we were in 1 Samuel chapter 15, move to 1 Samuel chapter 22. I told you King Saul, if you study him character wise, he had some weird thinking and analogy about him. This is one of them. Watch what happens here. 1 Samuel chapter 22, verse 19. Now, the setting and the context, you need to grasp the context, what goes on here, but this is, a, this is pretty, pretty wild what goes on here. We'll read a couple verses, and uh, we'll put this in here. Verse 19, he says, In Nob, the city of the priests, now the priests dealing with, this was Jewish priests. This was the Levitical tribe, and the Levitical tribe was broken down by family, so they had different names, and this was the city that they dwelled in. In Nob, uh, the city of the priests smote he with this, the he he's speaking of, if you back up, is King Saul, and he tells uh, Dog, or Dog, which however you want to pronounce that in verse 18, to fall on these priests uh, by the sword. And watch what, he's, watch what happens here as the Bible records this man. He knew exactly what he was doing 
in 1 Samuel chapter 15. Here's a proof of it. Both men and women, children and suckling and oxen and asses and sheep with the edge of the sword. You can read on down. That's what he told and instructed his men to do to the Levitical tribe and priests. And so you say, that, that's King Saul. So he knew what he should have been doing. Now I have you there. I should have developed that when I was over there. But turn back with me to Psalms chapter 18. I'm telling you, prison strongholds, no matter where you're at in your life, whether you're saved or lost, most of us here tonight are saved, thank God, but whether you're as a saved individual, that's my context for tonight in the teaching, uh, listen, prison strongholds will wreck your life and you won't even know it's going on. And you allow it because you reject the Word of God. And uh, that happens very subtly, but it does happen. Psalms chapter 18, and I'll get back to on track here. Psalms chapter 18, we don't want to look at verse 2, and it says, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I will trust, my buckler in the horn of my salvation in my high tower. Notice with me in verse 3, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, so shall I be saved from mine enemies. So, uh, this opposite of prison strongholds is truth strongholds and it's protection from the enemy and from prison strongholds in your mind is the Lord and the Word of God. Notice with me, pull with me to the right there, Psalms chapter 46. I'm watching the clock here. Psalms chapter 46 and we'll look at this verse here. Notice with me, 1 through 3, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore will not we fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof, Selah. Notice with me if we drop down to verse 7, the Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob is our refuge, Selah. So we see that God, God is that protection stronghold that we should hold to in our mind and our hearts. And I've taken all this from 2 Corinthians chapter 10 where the Bible says, casting down imagination in every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. And tonight, I'm saying it's, it's more real than what we realize or what we admit to that we battle every day. You see, in the end times, men before me that have gone on that I remember as a young man have stated clearly that in the end times, uh, the warfare is definitely more in the mind uh, than uh, physically uh, or, or less spiritually, but it's going to be in the mind. It's going to be dealing in the battlefields in the mind of the believer. And that's where everything starts. If you would be honest with yourself tonight, realize your decisions start in your mind and move to your heart and move into action. That's why you'll hear... I understand, yeah, there's people who say they love God, but then they walk and live like they don't love God. King Saul said, I have done everything God has told me to do. I have utterly destroyed everything. I have followed the commandments of the Lord. And it was the man of God who told him, you haven't. <laughs> because I hear the bleeding of sheep and the lowing of oxen, and I see the king that should have already been killed still alive. In many of our lives tonight, as in closing, there's a Malachite king in your life. There's the bleeding of sheep in your life. There's a lowing of oxen in your life. Tonight, you're being told from the Word of God that you need to step away from that. You need to realize and waken up that your mind and your imagination needs to be brought into the captivity of God, of Jesus Christ. That's who needs to be a ruler of your mind and heart through the Word of God that will fortify you and strengthen you, you and I. So tonight, there's two, two strongholds, a prison stronghold and a spiritual stronghold. Our next will develop from another character and we'll look at and go on further. Let's all stand up as pastor comes forward. Hopefully it's been a blessing. I gain a little, gain a little traction with this. And uh, we'll see what, what the Lord allows. But I enjoyed it. It was a blessing to me. Hopefully tonight it's been a blessing to you. Do not ignore the control and the power of the imagination. It needs to be brought into subjection of the Word of God and the knowledge of God. There according to 2 Corinthians chapter 10.
Pastor, what are we going to sing? 293.